I'm so pleased to be here this evening, this afternoon with you. Um, grateful to Dr. Trotter, uh, grateful to Hikari for making this day possible. Grateful, of course, to our speaker, um, Dr. Ed Baptist, for being with us. Uh, and grateful for the, for the collaboration of Requiem for Rice with Cause. We had a wonderful evening last night sharing a bit of the Requiem with you, the Requiem in process. Um, excerpts from the libretto, excerpts from Unburied, Unmourned, Unmarked, which explores the themes that will be elaborated upon in the Requiem. There will be more. Trevor Weston, Dr. Trevor Weston, our composer, will you stand up? He's still here with us. <laughs> both, both of us have been inspired by Dr. Baptist's book, and so Trevor wanted to stay to engage as well. Um, planning to bring Requiem to Pittsburgh in 2018, working on that as we speak, and working on workshopping more pieces of the Requiem here in Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh is a very important part of the development of this work. Um, I'm going to shift now to the main event, <laughs> which is our colleague and our friend, Professor Ed Baptist, who is currently a professor of history at Cornell specializing in 19th century U.S. history and the history of enslavement of African Americans in the South. Uh, Dr. Baptist earned his B.S. from Georgetown University, and we share an alma mater, University of Pennsylvania, where he earned his Ph.D. And I should say he's a few years older than me, just a few. So I was a babe in the rice fields when he was finishing his degree. <laughs> I started, I, I was an early starter, three years old. <laughs> His first monograph is Creating an Old South, Middle Florida's Plantation Frontier in the Civil War, UNC Press 2002. He then published an edited collection with our dear departed colleague, who is also um, from our alma mater, Stephanie Camp, New Studies in the History of the American I'm sorry, new, new Studies in the History of the American South, UGA Press 2012. And Drew Gilpin Faust, a very well-known Southern historian and former president of Harvard University, described this collection sets the agenda for a new generation of slavery studies. Steve Hahn, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, said that a remarkably good collection of essays that conceives of American in an appropriately expansive way and presents the work of some of the most innovative and dynamic young scholars in the field. Baptist's second monograph is The Half That Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, Basic Books, 2016. This is a very important work. And it's a work that has inspired, as I've said, many, many works of art, as well as um, scholars of all kinds, scholars of all stripes, to take sides on these important issues. Uh, two scholars in particular that I want to highlight are Dana Ramey from UT Austin, who has said that the half has never been told, has drawn attention to slavery in a way that few recent books have and Eric Foner of Columbia University wrote in the New York Times that Baptist breaks new ground in his emphasis on the centrality of the interstate trade in slaves to the regional and national economies and his treatment of the role of extreme violence in the workings of the slave system. This very important book in 2015 won the Avery O. Craven Prize from the Organization of American Historians it also, in 2015, won the Sidney Hillman Prize for journalists and scholars, investigative reporting, and deep storytelling. And that's one thing I appreciate about this book with all of its very grand theories. It's also just a very engaging read. Professor Baptist is a storyteller, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to a scholar in service of the common good, which exemplifies reportorial excellence, storytelling skill, 
and social justice impact. In 2014, this book, important work, won Bloomberg View Top 10 Nonfiction Books and Daily Beast Top Nonfiction Books. Currently, Professor uh, Baptist holds a Guggenheim Fellowship for his latest project, which examines the long arc of the fundamental feature of social, political, and cultural life in the United States, the, America, the nation's compulsion to police, surveil, and regulate the movement of African and African-American people in ways that are fundamentally different from policing whites. This promises to be another groundbreaking and important work. Please join me today in welcoming Professor Edward Baptist. I want to say uh, thanks for, all, for that uh, amazing and gracious introduction and uh, for all of the welcome that I've, I've gotten here. I, I did particularly enjoy the lunch and it was really uh, uh, kind of the, the students to share uh, some aspects of their experience here at, uh, at CMU. Um, I did talk to uh, Marcus Redeker of, of uh, University of Pittsburgh, who's not in, in town this year, and he said, oh yeah, you're coming to speak at cause. Uh, there's going to be a big turnout always is for cause events. Uh, it's faculty, it's staff, it's students, it's community, it's uh, just just people who are um, uh, all around Pittsburgh. And I said, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. Um, you know, uh, and then five people will come out. Uh, that's clearly, yeah, he was telling the truth. So I really do appreciate y'all uh, being here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about the, the new project that uh, uh, Professor Fields Black mentioned. Uh, and I've got a uh, uh, talk to give to kind of summarize the first, um, the first chapter or two that I'm, I'm working on. Because this is a, a history that, that really tries to go from 1619 to 2017. Not that I'm going to finish it in 2017, but, uh, but to go to the present and, and really talk about the connections uh, the changes, uh, but also the continuities in, in the history of uh, the policing of uh, people of African descent here in the U.S. and the resistance to that policing. That both policing and resistance uh, to policing are, are terms that can have uh, a, lot of, a lot of different meanings in different contexts, uh, which, which I hope I'm going to uh, lay out successfully here. But, um, this talk, uh, I've been changing the title a little bit, um, and you all can maybe tell me in the Q&A if it works, uh, and uh, it's got a little bit of a nod to, um, to somebody who's uh, also in Pennsylvania, which is Mumia, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, he's got a recent book called Have Black Lives Ever Mattered, uh, which collects a lot of his pieces uh, that he's, he's published from the prison. So it's called Police Citizens and Public Enemies Have Black Lives Ever Mattered. So last week in St. Louis, Missouri Circuit Court Judge Timothy Wilson, ruling in a bench trial, acquitted police officer Jason Stockley of the 2011 murder of Anthony Lamar Smith. Since then, as you probably know, the streets of St. Louis have been filled with protesters who've stopped traffic and refused to disperse uh, often in the face of heavily armored police. The police, in turn, have trampled elderly women, made dozens of arrests, and chanted, whose streets, our streets. In the 2011 homicide, Stockley and his partner spotted Smith in his car in a parking lot, and they concluded he was either buying or selling drugs. Uh, so Stockley got out of the police cruiser and approached Smith's car. Uh, some of you have probably been following this case, uh, so I apologize for the repetition. But he approached the car of the suspect carrying his personal AK-47, which he had with him against department policy. Smith fled, um, hitting the police car uh, as he, he drove away, and Stockley jumped into the cruiser. With his partner, uh, Officer Bianchi, at the wheel, the officers gave chase, and they reached a speed of over 80 miles an hour in a densely populated city, chasing a suspected retail drug dealer. 
Stockley was recorded by police video equipment as saying, we're killing this MF, uh, don't you know? Bianchi then rammed the police cruiser into Smith's car, incapacitating it. And then Stockley then proceeded to do exactly what he'd said he was going to do. He stepped out and he killed Anthony Lamar Smith. Uh, he walked over and shot him five times. Uh, the last one, prosecutors allege, was a kill shot from just uh, a foot or two away. He then returned to the cruiser, although he would later claim that he believed Smith was A, alive, and B, had a gun. Uh, and it's kind of odd he didn't try to secure the alleged gun. Uh, but what he said at the trial was he, what he was doing back at the car was getting first aid supplies. He did reach in a bag, but when he returned to the suspect's car, uh, he did not have his medical gloves on. Uh, he reached inside the car and supposedly found the silver revolver, which he handled with his bare hands. Investigators would find only Stockley's DNA on the gun. Now, it's desperately unusual for local prosecutors to bring <clears throat> charges against police officers who kill civilians, especially black ones. And it's even more rare for them to secure an indictment. In 2016, uh, in Cleveland, the local DA essentially threw the game, observers claimed, presenting the weakest version possible of the case that the grand jury had to, uh, uh, in what he claimed was an effort to get Officer Timothy Lohman uh, indicted for his execution of 12-year-old Tamir Rice. So when St. Louis prosecutors brought Jason Stockley to trial, everybody had to be surprised. Now, neither the US government nor, if we're honest, I think, uh, the, the academy has thought that the lives of those killed by police uh, were worthy enough to be counted with any regularity. That's all I can, that's all I can figure out because it just hasn't been done. Um, and in my own research so far, um, I've found uh, that over the last 100 years, not one New York City police, police officer has been convicted of murder or manslaughter for killing a black or Latino victim in the line of duty. So we don't know how many people are getting killed. Um, this is a problem we're only starting to address. Um, but we do know that nobody is getting um, uh, convicted of murder or manslaughter, by and large, uh, for the killings. Very few in the New York case, for instance, have been tried, <clears throat> and I've looked at hundreds of murders, um, hundreds of uh, killings, uh, and I've, I've only found one, that of police officer Thomas Shea, who gunned down 11-year-old Clifford Glover in 1973, and some of you um, may remember the news of this. And that's the only case where the police officer even spent one night in jail. As the NYPD goes, so goes uh, the nation and national law enforcement to a large extent. So. I don't think many were that surprised when the judge in Stockley's case ruled that the state had not proved murder charges against him. Over the last several years, activists have focused the nation's attention intensely on the issue of police killings, and they have not a single convicted police officer to show for it. It's almost as if judges, prosecutors, police, and juries, uh, and I think that's, that's key there, that this is not just authorities, um, this is wider groups of people as well. Um, that it's almost as if they're determined not to give in no matter the content of the particular cases. An article by Jeremy Stahl in Slate Magazine looked at the judge's explanation um, in the case of the killing of Anthony Lamar Smith and derided the judge's conclusions as pathetic rationalization. That's a quote, pathetic. Um, evidence that Stockley planted the gun to Stahl and other commentators seemed pretty compelling, um, but the judge simply um, ignored it and, and said, uh, well, um, it's perfectly plausible to me uh, that an urban heroin dealer uh, would be carrying a gun. Urban heroin dealer is what uh, the, the um, judge said. Um, and he also excused plain evidence of Stockley stating the intent to kill, followed by his proceeding to do so. So I suspect that by September 2017, we can all agree it's very hard uh, to convict a police officer of anything when they kill a black man, woman, or child. And the cheapness, the legal not mattering of black life, uh, extends beyond police killings. And, and so, um, or at least that's the charge mounted by Black Lives Matter and allied movements. Whites acting in vigilante capacity seem to benefit from great legal and public deference when they shoot African Americans who they find threatening. We could even talk about the ways in which it's, it's not just the actual incidents, but the way that they are deployed in popular culture and daily interactions um, not just what people may be thinking about them, but what they are saying. Uh, on my own home campus this year, um, there's, there have been repeated 
um, reports that the name Trayvon is being used as a kind of intimidation by white students against young black male students. So this critique um, is about, um, this critique that's offered by Black Lives Matter and the broader movement um, is, is about how uh, so many Americans, not only, uh, so many white Americans in particular seem to not only think that uh, black lives don't matter, but they also seem to think that if black lives did matter, white life as they understood it could not matter, or could not matter in the same way that it matters now. And we can see this in the widespread condemnation of Black Lives Matter, despite the fact that its advocates continually repeat uh, and remind people that Black Lives Matter as a slogan does not mean other lives do not matter. Um, recent polling data shows that two-thirds of self-identified white Americans have a negative perception of the movement. Opposition to it is almost universal among uh, Trump voters, and many of them reported that they considered it terrorist. In his Republican National Convention speech in Cleveland, the city where Tamir Rice is buried, Donald Trump argued that immigrants and protests against police killings were responsible for, quote, violence in our streets and chaos in our communities. And of course, Black Lives Matter identifies itself as a social justice movement that carries out nonviolent, if confrontational, protests. But the critique uh, that's been launched by BLM and the larger movement, for which it's kind of a shorthand, um, is both trenchant, you know, sharp, cutting, and it's also broad. And I have not observed that radical, and the word, the root of radical actually really means grasping the root as a term, grabbing the root. I haven't observed that radical grasping the root critiques uh, of white power and privilege are allowed to pass without punishment being inflicted on the critics. This is a radical uh, critique. It's focused on police and vigilante violence in recent years, but it ties in with those who insist we must confront and abolish mass incarceration. The massive impact of the prison industrial complex is some of our finest scholars working, and you'll have two of those very fine scholars coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, this, this impact uh, of the prison industrial complex is tied in not only with policing, but extends throughout American society, economics, and politics in ways that are both obvious and hidden. The carceral state, as some call it, a government devoted to control, surveillance, and locking up has destroyed countless families and neighborhoods, sucked resources away from public schools, starved state university systems, created entire communities dependent on corrections labor, and disfranchised millions of black citizens. And so together with policing, and I think we should see these as you know, part of a spectrum, mass incarceration enacts a world, a social and political world in which black life doesn't matter. By the influence of electoral distortions as mighty as, their, as a three-fifths compromise, mass incarcerations, architects and defenders have subjected the entire republic to their chosen undemocratic policies. And they've been permitted to do so because along with police violence and a massive strapping up of increasingly armed civilians, they thus promise that an entire system of policing and incarceration will contain, quote unquote, black criminality. That symbolic threat, uh, whether it's expressed directly or not, has certainly been conjured energetically and repeatedly from the 1960s forward by politicians, social commentators, and propagandists. And it, ever since the 60s, it, it has been more visible than it was, for instance, during World War II or the early days of the Cold War, uh, when the U.S. government was at pains to try to distinct, make itself seem distinct uh, from its enemies. But the 1960s, when um, black rebellion sparked by police violence against African Americans broke out in numerous cities, was of course not the first time that the spirit of white fear of uncontrolled criminal blackness had been conjured and made to do heavy political lifting. In fact, as activists and scholars are pointing out today, the support of many whites for the obsessive, violent policing of black life and movement is a recurring pattern of U.S. history. Both the support and, practice in, and the support and practices, in fact, were there before the U.S. and helped to make the U.S. They helped to form white people and whiteness uh, as identity. So when legislature, legislators and the Fraternal Order of Police reactively depict any critique of, much less protest, against the policing of black life and mobility as an existential threat to law and order in the United States of America. The protest is seen as an existential threat. They're reproducing a historical continuity. And it's hard for us to think about historical continuity. Things have been the same or um, similar uh, for a very long time. It's hard. 
uh, it's intimidating to think about confronting uh, and changing them. And it is true that not everything in this story is continuous or exactly the same uh, all the time. Lots of things have happened since 1619. Lots of things have happened since 1865 when slavery officially ended in the U.S. But the history before 1865 tells us a lot about why Jason Stockley went free, I think, and also about why protesters took to the street. I think we have to understand how the policing of African Americans and slavery has shaped the surveillance and control, uh, and the attempted surveillance and control of black movement and life uh, ever since. And if we can understand the early policing of black movement as well as resistance to policing, I think we can better understand uh, enslavement's long-term effects, uh, the creation of white solidarity across class and regional lines, and why many whites have understood uh, this policing as essential to not only their own freedom, but to the nation itself. So I'm trying to learn more about this. My work on this subject is, is not really, I think, that original. I'm drawing explicitly, uh, for instance, on um, Stephanie Camp, who uh, Professor Fields Black uh, mentioned, um, who reminded us that the control of movement was always essential to everything, every other kind of control in slavery. Also drawn thinkers like Angela Davis, Cedric Robinson, W.B. Du Bois, you know, we always drawn Du Bois because he wrote about everything uh, and he, he wrote it very well. Uh, Neil Roberts, um, um, Kali Nicole Gross, uh, another Penn uh, alum we're very proud to, to be associated with. Um, and uh, Luther Adams, um, uh, who is now writing about um, resistance uh, to police brutality, um, and who I know had a postdoc here, uh, here uh, a few years ago. And finally, I'm, I'm involved in a project with two other historians, uh, Molly Mitchell and Josh Rothman, that's trying to collect um, all of the surviving uh, so-called runaway slave ads from US history. And there's over 100,000 of them. And what we want to do is put them on a website where we can kind of crowdsource the transcription and the analysis of that. So um, that's something that uh, I, I hope will be publicly available in the next uh, year and a half or so. But I want to make, uh, just based on my, um, my own early research, I want to make, I think, five um, specific points um, about this topic. And here's the first. When we look at the process of English-speaking settlement in North America, we see that black movement was understood to be one of the biggest problems to be solved by the leaders of colonial and early national societies. They saw black movement as a problem and they wanted to solve it. Um, many uh, whites in the North American colonies, because of this, uh, because of this impetus and, and this focus, came to see the policing of people of African descent as a social and legal commitment so necessary that it preceded uh, all others. And we can see evidence of this because a significant portion of the earliest court cases and laws that show that slavery even existed in colonial Virginia are about the control of African people's movement and the, making the distinction between that and European servants' movements. So in early cases and laws, Virginia lawmakers specifically marked out African fugitives as fundamentally different. Uh, from white fugitives. Uh, one of the earliest cases on the record is that of John Punch, an African who tried to run away with two European indentured servants. And his status is sort of ambiguous in the record, but they were all caught, all three were whipped, and the servants had their time of service extended by three years, but the lawmakers affirmed that Punch's service uh, was for life. Literally on the same page of the record, uh, uh, the record books from, from the governor's council in early Virginia, uh, the council reported that they had heard of a group of runaway Negroes uh, in Charles River County, and they ordered a group of militia to go and attack and capture them. And about two weeks later, uh, the general court, which was composed of some of the same guys, ruled on the fates of six servants and a Negro uh, who had been recaptured as fugitives. And the court assigned different punishments um, to them as well. Some of the white servants had time added to their terms of bound labor. Some were whipped. One was branded with an R on his cheek, one was simply returned to his master, but Emmanuel, the Negro, um, got the worst of everything. He was branded with an R, got 30 lashes, was forced to work the next year in shackles, and then would continue uh, as a slave for the rest of his life. 1660, a Virginia statute added time to the, uh, uh, the terms of servants who tried to escape together with the enslaved. 
saying that the former shall serve for the time of the Negro's absence. And think about that. That's a powerful disincentive for servants um, to run away with slaves. It creates a separation between them, and it also gives an incentive uh, to European indentured servants to turn in those who are rebelling um, with them, maybe even cutting a deal that lets them escape some punishment. <clears throat> and there were similar laws established throughout 17th century North America to actively create and deepen differences in status between Europeans and Africans, specifically around this issue of fugitivity. So this is key point two. The policing, or here's how we get to it. Uh, anyway, the policing of all Africans as potential runaways didn't just depend on elite government decisions. It also depended on the cooperation and consent of the emerging white working class of former servants and less wealthy settlers. And in a 1668 Virginia law, we see an early invocation of the idea that black resistance to authority was of a different nature than that of white resistance. And the need to suppress black crime meant that black life could not be allowed to matter. The law said that it is possible to add time to punish a servant who strikes a master, but such a penalty, quote, cannot be inflicted upon Negroes nor the obstinacy of many of them by other than violent means suppressed. And so this wrote into law the idea that Africans were obstinate, whether because of despair driven by enslavement's increasingly perpetual nature or an internal tendency. I'm not sure what the lawmakers had in their minds. In some ways, it doesn't matter. What mattered to them was preventing enslaved Africans from striking back. Uh, and it went on to say that when a slave died under a quote-unquote correction, murder was no crime for, quote, it cannot be presumed that any, that prepensed malice, which alone makes murder into a felony, as opposed to manslaughter, uh, which was essentially a misdemeanor in those days, um, there's no reason to think uh, that prepensed malice should induce any man to destroy his own estate. One couldn't threaten a resisting enslaved African by threatening to treat them like a slave, they already were. One had to convince them that one was willing to kill them if they did not comply. And the lives of white servants, meanwhile, were increasingly uh, being protected. And status uh, for recently freed uh, servants by the end uh, of the 17th century was being raised. So these colonial laws offer not only punishments for being black, but rewards for being white. The right to kill without consequence which masters received in the 1668 law is a profound kind of empowerment. It made all the owners of that uh, species of property, a class which by the early 18th century was probably as many as a third of all white Virginians into sovereigns of their own despotic kingdoms. And then this power was extended to all whites by 1705 when the Virginia Slave Code empowered all whites to kill any outlawed runaway slave. In South Carolina, they'd have that power since 1690. This law treated its black target as less than human. It also raised all the white people in the colony um, to persons above the normal range of humans, giving them the power to judge, convict, and execute. A European social science uh, conceptions say that um, one of the things that makes the state modern in modern times is that it takes into itself uh, the power to dispense violence. It eliminates private violence and collects the capacity uh, to exercise legitimate violence uh, to itself. But the emergent, uh, emergent 17th century right of white Virginians and Carolinians and Marylanders and so on uh, to kill um, black uh, Virginians, Carolinians, etc., cetera, um, suggests a different path to modernization. The decision to make the unpermitted mobility of black fugitives punishable by death meant not that the state was replacing the capricious law of the king the sovereign, or that all citizens were equal before the state. Um, it meant instead that in the new world, regardless of property ownership, every equal and now defined as white citizen had become a king. <clears throat> now the idea of replacing the king with a white citizen um, is, a, is a pretty sweeping one, the idea that that's what happened. Um, and it calls to mind what the historian Edmund Morgan said uh, in colonial Virginia, American slavery made American freedom possible as a concept and as a lived political reality for the colony's white men. The defining of the enslaved as perpetually degraded and different allowed the wealthy and poor whites of the colony to define themselves together as one formally equal group, uh, formally, formally, uh, not economically, but formally equal, 
bound by their whiteness. They're not blackness. They're not slaveness. But another way to look at these concepts, which I think is also helpful for understanding how colonial slavery shaped the future, the future we're now living in, um, whites who had all the legal uh, right to kill runaway slaves weren't just sovereigns, uh, but they were citizens of a new kind of polity. They were defined as legitimate inhabitants, to quote a South Carolina law of the colonies, as they would later be called citizens in the new state constitutions after 1776. They were called this uh, in part because they were expected to, required to, rewarded for, and always did police Africans. So let's don't just call them citizens, let's call them police citizens. Put a little dash in between it so we know it goes together. Police citizens. Let's call this key point three. That this is the kind of citizenship that evolves, uh, at least one crucial aspect of the kind of citizenship that evolves in the slave-holding North American colonies. Now let's think about the kind of power that it promised and I think still does promise to whites. And understand that uh, this promise can only truly be held if there are others who do not have that status. And that's why I suspect resistance or even criticism, uh, resistance or even criticism of police surveillance, control, and violence, even if that policing plainly seems to violate the letter of the law, and even if that criticism is within the bounds of free expression, kneeling at the, the national anthem, for instance, it seems to threaten uh, white citizenship itself. It's threatening to that because it's threatening to the concept of police citizenship, the idea that the citizens are police. That's essentially a part of what makes them citizens. Police citizenship wasn't then and isn't now just for police professionals. Uh, colonial slave codes um, gave all whites uh, the power to exercise ever more systematic surveillance of the enslaved. Um, by the late 1600s, um, so-called servants, uh, which a class which included slaves, um, and this law had to carry passes to prove that they were not runaways. And in fact, as enslaved populations rose, colonies required whites to check those passes. Here's South Carolina's 1712 law. Every person who shall not, when in his power, apprehend every Negro or other slave, which he shall see out of his master's plantation without leave, i.e. without a pass, and after apprehended, she'll neglect to punish him with moderate whipping. She'll forfeit 20 shillings. New England colonies actually created similar laws, uh, and, and uh, Virginia and Maryland were not far behind. So by the early 1700s, colonial law represented African people as perpetual possible fugitives whose mobility had to police. And in fact, uh, their mobility and, resi and uh, resistance was seen as an existential um, uh, social threat. Uh, and we could see this by the way that potential um, uh, revolts um, are policed, are policed uh, very carefully. Um, the 1722 Virginia Slave Code um, provides an entire array uh, of torture, um, the extraction of information, and then the execution uh, of offenders who may be involved in an alleged um, insurrection. Um, and this wasn't just for enslaved Africans. Uh, this was also for, quote, such free Negroes, mulattoes, or Indians, um, so that they may be under greater obligation to declare the truth about things like potential uh, revolts. Um, the law also enabled ad hoc courts, called courts of Oye and Termine, uh, to carry out uh, the public torture and maiming of even those um, nominally free people who are presumed to side against the law with the forces of disorder. The same 1722 Virginia Code, by the way, mandated castration for male slaves caught running away a fourth time. Again, Virginia was behind South Carolina in this, which always was kind of at the edge in brutality. Um, black fugitives were thus, at least in the eyes of the law, not freedom seekers, but by definition, dangerous criminals, public enemies whose uncontrolled mobility threatened the entire structure of law and order in colonial society. Now, the law required police work of colonial white police citizens. Um, laws requiring white men to participate in slave patrols began to appear in the late 17th century. But being police citizens also gave immense benefits uh, to virtually all whites. Their freedoms from and freedoms to that have to do with status and identity uh, and attitude, but they're also material beliefs so, or material benefits um, to people who are conceived as police citizens. 
patrolling laws paid patrollers or named captains for districts which opened offices to aspirant elites, people who wanted to come up uh, in society by being patrol captains. And there were other less concrete, um, but still, still material rewards, the ability to bully, to search and steal the possessions of enslaved people when one was out on patrol, um, to create uh, chaos in the middle of the night like armed roving fraternity parties, um, to coerce sex. These things were all part of patrolling. We know this from the records, um, from the memories of the people uh, who were patrolled. These powers allowed all white men, and perhaps in some ways all whites, to act as if they were all equally free to treat African people uh, as their prey. Now, laws, of course, had to be implemented if they were to um, matter in practice. And when you look at the 1700s and the 18th century records of Virginia's House of Burgesses, uh, this is its colonial legislature, and it's one of the places where when you do a traditional retelling of uh, colonial history, uh, you talk about the House of Burgesses, you talk about Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. Uh, and this is one of the places where um, independence, um, freedom were generated. But when you look at the actual daily business of the House of Burgesses, a whole lot of it is about the apprehension of runaway slaves and the rewards of those who do that. So uh, there was sort of a dual reward structure. Um, advertisements listed the rewards that would be paid by the enslaver once the uh, enslaved person was recaptured. But the colonial legislature often um, was petitioned to top off that reward. Um, sometimes just because a fugitive had gone um, and, uh, and uh, gone especially far. Uh, and so there was an extra bonus on top of the a standard bonus for mileage, and sometimes because a fugitive uh, was supposed to be uh, particularly um, dangerous. And the legislative uh, records also include claims for compensation by enslavers whose human property was destroyed in the process of being saved from self-emancipation. Um, even death, if it resulted from resistance, the white police citizens ended with overwhelming force, was an opportunity for the state to dispense revenue to individual whites. And this incentivized policing violence, right? Because then uh, the enslavers themselves would not be afraid because of material reasons to kill uh, their own quote unquote property uh, because they would get a reward from the state uh, for doing this. So all of these compensations uh, plus appropriations for militia um, used to intimidate slaves and Indians, uh, plus payments to sustain the functioning of the court system, much of whose business at the local level also involved the surveillance and policing of enslaved people, consumed a significant portion of the colonial state's budget. The revenues that sustained that budget came from taxes on the tobacco trade. Tobacco, of course, was made by enslaved Africans. Their labor product was taxed to pay for the web of chains that suspended them in captivity from which death um, was supposed to be uh, the only escape. So the legal frameworks, political structures, and social habits of colonial America developed as a self-reinforcing pattern of policing black mobility. Imagine what this means for the protection of innocent life, which is usually seen as one of the main purposes of law enforcement. White people had immense legal latitude in which to kill black people without paying a price, and indeed could expect in many cases to get a monetary reward and be praised for protecting public safety. And that's key point four. The deeply ingrained suspicion of black mobility meant that black lives simply did not matter compared to the other imperatives which the system was supposed to create uh, and push uh, and incentivize and which white police citizens were supposed to internalize. And let's consider a limit case to see what this means. And here's where I have to warn you. Um, reading this case in the archives was like watching the gates of hell open up. Right? And so it's a rough, it's a rough story. Um, but I think these are names that need to be said. These are things um, that need to be remembered. On the morning of November 9th, 1770 in Accomack County uh, of Virginia, three women were together at the house of uh, Benjamin West. Elizabeth West, Benjamin's daughter, Sarah Colony, another white woman, and a quote unquote Negro woman we don't know her name uh, in the record, uh, but she was owned by the West. Um, slaveholders and landholders, uh, that's who the West were. Now, Accomack was part of Virginia's eastern shore. These are two peninsular counties across the Chesapeake from the mainland. They have a 
a, a different vibe even, even today uh, from the rest of the uh, Old Dominion. Uh, they're maritime, they're a little quirky. Um, but just as on mainland uh, Virginia, slavery had long since been the daily reality of Africans and African Americans, like the unnamed woman who was at the West House that morning. And slavery had always been the legal status for every day of the short life of Stepney, who was a seven-year-old boy. And, and he, was, uh, uh, he was mute. He couldn't, uh, couldn't speak. Um, that was a, his uh, disability. Um, and this morning, this November 9th, he was standing on the dirt road that ran past the Westland when a white man named Moses Riggs came walking over the horizon towards him. And Riggs was carrying a musket. And a few minutes later, Moses Riggs appeared at the West House holding uh, a metal tube in his hand, and he seemed distracted, and he announced that he had killed the devil, um, Ben West's Negro boy. And the three women could see that his pants were covered in blood, and the tube, uh, a gun barrel, they now realized was covered in brain matter. And the gun Riggs babbled was, quote, unquote, a legacy left him by his daddy. Uh, and then he repeated, I've killed the devil with it. Elizabeth West and the other woman then followed, uh, other women, they followed her father who already rushed out of the house. Not far up the road, they found Stepney's small body. He lay beside the car tracks in the dirt. His skull was caved in, and blood and brain matter were strewn all over the place. Pieces of the broken wood gun stock were everywhere, suggesting that Riggs had beaten Stepney to death with it uh, until the handle separated with a gun barrel. And there was a hole ripped in his abdomen, which confirmed one of Riggs's rants, um, that he had, quote, punched the muzzle of the said gun into his body until the green poison ran out. Somebody went to the home of the nearest county judge to procure a warrant. Now, everybody knew that there was something wrong with Moses Riggs before this. Earlier that morning, earlier that morning, a, a witness later reported he threatened to kill a different child uh, and had also told somebody else that he had met the day before a little devil driving an old one in a cart, but he was afraid that the old one would be too strong for him. But Moses was also cunning. Uh, when he was arrested, he was asked, why did you kill this boy who, quote, could not offend him either by word as he could not speak or by his actions as he was too small? But perhaps, Moses said, perhaps if I had not killed him, he would have killed me. Riggs's br brutal crime shocked even Accomack County whites who were permitted by the law to inflict many kinds of violence on, uh, on enslaved Africans. County judges sent Riggs across Chesapeake Bay to Williamsburg. He was tried there in the colony's highest court, found guilty of murder, and condemned to die. There was no such thing in those days as a formalized insanity plea, but this was still an unusual outcome in the context of colonial America in particular. Convicting a white killer for the murder of an enslaved black boy was incredibly rare, and this is the only case I've found where it happened. In fact, in Virginia, in the 170 years between 1619 and 1789, only three whites were executed for killing blacks, all on a single 1739 day, uh, and they all uh, were overseers who had killed uh, the slaves of wealthy men. Somebody was trying to make a point. A judge and a governor were trying to make a point. These were the only such cases that I found in the colony's history. In the same time period, Virginia state, colonial, and local governments, the governments executed at least 279 individuals. At least 190 of them were black. Um, and many were killed for crimes like housebreaking uh, and others in cases that a neutral observer might consider uh, self-defense, but they were sentenced to die nonetheless. And what's unmeasured in this stat, um, and here we think about what the federal government and to the large extent, again, the academy doesn't measure today, what's unmeasured is how many enslaved men, women, and children were killed by whites because, of course, in most cases, that was not a crime. So they were not counted. And so I doubt if Riggs's crime really surprised the enslaved African Americans of Accomack County. And it surely could not have surprised them when the Virginia Executive Council, made up of some of the richest men in the colony, followed his conviction by turning around and recommending that the royal governor stay the madman's execution. They believed he was, quote, a fit object of mercy, uh, since he appeared to be of insane mind. Uh, and they suggested that a letter be sent to King George III recommending a pardon for the unfortunate uh, man. Now, was Riggs insane? Well, it's possible that psychotic murderers sometimes act out in extreme form the obsessive fears of the sane society in which they live. It's possible. I can't prove it. Uh, 
I can't prove that the madness of Moses Riggs expressed aversion, distorted and magnified, of the fears of Anglo-American whites by the 1770s. But what's more possible to do is to look at what the judges did and did not do. In protecting Moses Riggs' white life and behaving as if the killing, the killing of a black boy did not matter as much as the hunting and the killing of a runaway, for instance, the men who implemented law acted out the principles of the larger system of controlling black movement and creating freedom for whites in the colonies. Now, in the decade that followed uh, Moses Riggs's murder of Stepney, freedom itself would be in the minds of white settlers brought to a new level, a new birth by national independence. Uh, and enslaved people who had long been challenging uh, the white consensus behind the containment of black movement by running away repeatedly and by leading re rebellions um, did the same thing during the revolution. They took advantage of the chaos uh, to do this, trying to make the colonist rebellion into a war for their own freedom, and many times by actually uh, joining the British against their own rebel enslavers. But a recent book by the historian Robert uh, Parkinson shows that supporters of independence manipulated fellow whites' fear of black and native people's potential revolt in order to build white consensus behind the independence project. And you might have heard of uh, Virginia Royal Governor Lord Dunmore and how he tried to recruit a, uh, what he called an Ethiopian legion from Africans enslaved by the rebels, uh, and how that helped um, convince many who are on the fence in Virginia to join the independence side. Uh, but as Parkinson shows us, that's just one of many, many stories that were planted uh, and circulated, um, some true, some not true. Actually, Benjamin Franklin planted a false one uh, that said that Native people and African people uh, were going to join the side of the British uh, and were going to actually participate in the enslavement of the colonists themselves. Now, some enslaved people's self-liberating actions succeeded. Um, during periods when the British controlled New York, Charleston, and Savannah, tens of thousands escaped to British lines, uh, and some of them uh, managed to sort of uh, melt into those communities even after uh, the, um, the Americans came back uh, and, and joined some of the growing free black communities there. Others ended up in Nova Scotia, the Bahamas, Sierra Leone, Britain itself. And they would be very significant in the long run um, to the wider abolition um, project. <clears throat> and even colonial rebels' own central statement of justification for the revolt helped enable some enslaved people's resistance. The Declaration of Independence was incorporated into the uh, 1780 Massachusetts State Constitution. And that became the basis for Elizabeth Freeman's claim for personal freedom from enslavement in Massachusetts. Uh, we often remember her as Mum Bet. Uh, and she won her case in 1780 using the Massachusetts state constitution as leverage in a Massachusetts court. Uh, she was enslaved in Massachusetts. And the next year, the uh, Massachusetts Supreme Court agreed with Quack Walker's claim that his detention in slavery was incompatible with the new state constitution. We often think of that as the end of slavery uh, in Massachusetts. And that was the formal end. It kind of proceeded at an informal pace. But that didn't destroy the impulse to police black movement. Um, in fact, despite the emergence of limited emancipations in northern New England in the same decade of the 1780s, the policing of African Americans seemed at first to become a division point in the new nation, but then became a point of union. <clears throat> 1779, as the British attacked Low Country, South Carolina, a privateer called the Victoria made off with 34 enslaved people from the Pauly the, the properties along the Waccamaw River. And this British vessel was captured by a Massachusetts privateer called the Tyrannicide. And the Tyrannicide took uh, those 34 people to, um, to Boston, where they were incarcerated for a while at Castle Harbor, which is a gigantic um, jail. 20 of them were uh, removed from the Bay State by agents of South Carolina enslavers uh, and their government uh, around 1782. But many of the others had already been hired out to work uh, for uh, various whites, uh, including John Hancock in one case, uh, in, um, in, in Massachusetts. And so the slave owners couldn't find them. And so uh, they tried to get local courts in Massachusetts to issue writs of habeas corpus to have these individuals see seized. Um, and they pushed the Massachusetts state governor to go along with it, but he refused. And he said, there's no way we can do this because we've had this legal change. Uh, we no longer have 
uh, an institution, a legal institution called slavery in this state. And the South Carolina governor was so angry that he actually threatened disunion. This is a long time before 1861. Uh, this, is, uh, this is 1783. But cooler heads prevailed. South Carolina and Massachusetts representatives to the Continental Congress and to the 1787 um, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia worked together to craft what eventually became the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution, still in the Constitution, in fact. Uh, Article uh, 4, Section 2, Clause 3, um, which committed states to return their owner, uh, return to their owner or their master, um, those persons held to service or labor who had escaped from other states. And in 1793, uh, the federal government, the Congress passes a law operationalizing the Fugitive Slave Clause, which bound states like Massachusetts with growing free black populations not to interfere with the seizure of allegedly fugitive African people. And so there was now a national agreement to pursue fugitives. So here's key point five. In the revolution and constitution, white police citizenship came to help define independence uh, and the nation. Because it's not clear that the southern states would have joined uh, without this agreement. It was, that was one of the issues on which they were holding out. In the wake of national agreement during the early 19th century, uh, even in the free states, fugitive slave laws and other such laws and practices constrained black movement and black life under a heavy blanket of suspicion. Ohio and white lawmakers and commentators, for instance, described free blacks as worse than drones to society. If allowed to remain peacefully in Ohio, they would multiply like locusts. Uh, and perhaps some whites worried would somehow uh, conquer uh, Ohio. Um, policing uh, responded, um, and there's a disproportionate number. Uh, if you look at the early jails and prisons of even the North, there's a disproportionate number of free blacks who are uh, incarcerated today. So in both law and practice, what evolved in the northern states of the new nation as part of this broader evolution uh, out of the system of slavery and its surveillance uh, policing of African Americans, what evolved in the northern states would be as much the precedent for today as would be the system of slavery that persisted, deepened, and expanded in the southern ones uh, until um, 1865. The discrimination and surveillance that evolved in the northern states was in one sense the policing of all African Americans as suspected fugitive slaves uh, from the south, as if they were suspected. And you can practically hear Malcolm X pointing, pointing out that the Mason-Dixon line is the Canadian border. <laughs> he said it. Uh, and uh, maybe it's still true. Um, <clears throat> his point, in a sense, isn't just that social prejudice against blacks exists in the North, though that's part of it, uh, but it's also about the agreement of virtually all whites in the U.S. to police African Americans, even in the 20th century, uh, when Malcolm X was speaking, as if they were actual uh, and potential uh, or potential fugitives from slavery. Now, you might wonder what became of Moses Riggs. After the colony of Virginia declined to execute him in 1771, he remained locked in the Williamsburg jail. And the neighboring cells frequently had fugitive slaves who'd been recaptured. And then in 1776, after Lord Dunmore had fled, and a revolutionary convention sat down to create the newly independent state's frame of government, uh, someone in that constitutional, that state constitutional convention became aware of his situation. And on June 29th, 1776, right before um, uh, July 4th, um, things were happening in Philadelphia at the same time. On that date, the convention ordered that Moses Riggs be discharged from his confinement in the public jail. He was free to walk out, and he did. Freedom for the white nation meant freedom for Moses Riggs. 1776, Stephanie would have been 13. And in the years to come, the policing of black people in what was now becoming the United States had been different from that of whites for the better part of two centuries. For most of that time, Africans and African Americans have been treated presumptively not just as slaves, but as potential fugitive slaves, uh, fugitives, uh, or even rebels. <clears throat> they weren't treated just as criminals, but as particularly destabilizing ones, uh, enemies whose freedom from constraint and ability to move would be, if, if they had that, a threat to law, to order, and to white freedom itself. Black freedom and white freedom were understood by many whites, it seems, as opposite terms, linked in a kind of zero-sum relationship. It was the job of the law, of law enforcement, and all white citizens, all police citizens, 
to surveil, suspect, contain, to use violence if necessary to black people so that white people could be free. And even the end of slavery did not bring an end to the fundamental significance of the way that both authorities and white populations strove to police black movement, or to the assumption that white citizenship, um, at least on the part of some or even many whites, this assumption was there, um, contained somehow the duty and the right to police black people. If you don't believe me, talk to anybody who runs a 911 uh, line. I've come to the conclusion that it's impossible to overstate the significance of the legacy of slavery's imperative to police black movement. It's hard to find political developments in the recent US that are not in some way shaped by this legacy. There's obviously not the time here to talk about Jim Crow and the postbellum South or its cousins in the North and the West, nor to talk about the racialized rise and expansion of mass incarceration on the ruins of Jim Crow, Jim Crow nor to connect it all to the patterns of policing that have given us the present um, and seemingly endless um, crisis. But the resonance is seen clear to many. Much work, of course, has to be done to evaluate the apparent connections that stretch from 1619 to 1865 to 2017. They might be more, uh, they might be less direct um, than they appear, um, but then on the other hand, they might not only be direct, uh, but more significant um, than we have realized. In fact, maybe it's important that we banish the assumption that the legacies of slavery in general grow smaller over time. Maybe, in fact, they're getting bigger every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.